people of the internet, my name is Johnny and welcome to a FNAF movie news video that I was not at all expecting to make today. In fact, I was literally just about to click start recording for a traditional normal FNAF news video because we've gotten so much info on the movie that's kind of all we've been talking about recently. But today had other plans because I kid you not, we just got a 15 page long document detailing brand new details about the upcoming FNAF movie. So because this document is so long, I don't want to waste too much time here at the start, though I will give a heads up, this document does contain some pretty minor spoilers for the movie. Some plot points, a few motives for characters, and deeper meanings behind what their role is in the film. It's nothing too, too massive, like this doesn't give away the ending or anything, but definitely if you're trying to avoid spoilers, especially because we're getting so close to the film's release, I'd say skip this video. But hey, while you're here, why not scroll down and subscribe? So this is the document. I'm not going to read the full thing, but I'm definitely going to be pointing out some of the more interesting topics here. And if you do want to read the full thing, that'll be Link down below but it starts off with a deeper synopsis a description summary for the film so let's go ahead and read that can you survive five nights the terrifying horror game phenomenon becomes a blood chilling cinematic event as blumhouse brings five nights at freddy's to the silver screen the film follows mike played by josh hutcherson a troubled young man caring for his 10 year old sister abby played by piper rubio and haunted by the unsolved disappearance of his younger brother more than a decade before recently fired and desperate for work so that he can keep custody of Abby, Mike agrees to take a position as a night security guard at an abandoned theme restaurant, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, but Mike soon discovers that nothing at Freddy's is what it seems. With the aid of Vanessa Shelley, a local police officer played by Elizabeth Lale, Mike's nights at Freddy's will lead him into unexplainable encounters with the supernatural and drag him into the black heart of unspeakable nightmare. The film also stars Mary Stuart Masterson as Mike's icy Aunt Jane, Pat Carner Sterling as Abby's caring babysitter, Maxine and Matthew Lillard as Steve Raglan, Mike's smug career counselor. We get a very detailed look at all of the crew members involved in the film. The document then gets into the backstory of how the film actually came to be, a story that I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with at this point, seeing as it's been eight and a half years since the film was first announced. It goes into Scott Cawthon about how he was a struggling game developer, how he released Chipper and Sons Lumber Company, which got a fair bit of backlash, saying how the characters in the game were unintentionally terrifying and then of course led Scott Cawthon to release Five Nights at Freddy's and it blew up it became this big cultural phenomenon that we all know and love today when Hollywood came Colin Cawthon was justifiably protective of his creation and wary of a film industry that didn't exactly have a great history with game to film adaptations this is of course when Jason Blum reached out from Blumhouse saying it's a perfect project for the Blumhouse banner the games are horrifying fun and engaging and they have a built-in community where people of all ages across the world can come together and share in something bigger than themselves so Blum reached out to Cawthon to start a conversation about what might be possible for Five Nights and Blumhouse. He had attempted to develop a movie with another company, which I'm sure, as we all know, was Warner Brothers, though that didn't go well. As we started working together and we got to know one another, we began to trust each other more. Over the course of the eight years or so that we worked on the movie, we developed a terrific partnership. I respect him and I know he respects me. Hopefully, this will be the first of many movies we make together. Then we got some quotes from Scott himself saying the biggest challenge was finding the right story that people could connect with. Jason always believed in my vision for this. And even though my pursuit of that vision ended up delaying the movie for quite some time, I'm very happy with the end result. That would have never happened without Jason Blum and his team at Blumhouse. I don't think I will ever be able to fully explain express my gratitude. I'm not going to keep reading too, too much, but they do just keep going back and forth showing just how much of a buddy-buddy relationship they have now, which hopefully does mean more FNAF movies in the future. After Cawthon drafted an initial screenplay, the next step was finding the right creative captain to oversee the project. Blum suggested Emma Tammy, with who he had recently worked on two horror anthologies and a documentary for Blumhouse TV. Tammy's ambition was to create a film that would both terrify and entertain, but also to resonate. You go to horror movies, to Blumhouse movies, to be scared, Tammy says. And with our protagonist Mike, the haunting of his past goes deeper than the jump scares, as he struggles with guilt and shame that he can't reconcile. 
time. On top of that, there is an incredible ambience and tension within the setting of the pizzeria, like in the game. And a bit of humor sprinkled throughout the movie. All of this is meant to be experienced collectively. I hope the film takes audiences on a fun ride and also an emotional journey that stays with them even after the jump scares are over. Blum saying Emma's approach to the world of Freddy's was really second to none. She was able to fine tune the story in a way that had previously been missing, bringing a heart to the story that made you more invested in the characters. She hit it off incredibly well with Scott immediately and they had a great collaboration in bringing the world to life. They go on to talk about refining the script writing process, you know, the stakes involved with the film, the haunted house element as they call it. And then we actually get to Jim Henson's shop getting involved, saying the actual process of building the characters was painstaking and labor intensive by design. Tammy says, I would stop by Henson's to check in on things and it was a sight to behold. Everyone was working on these designs. Certain parts were being built over here, the others were being sewn over there, everything was done by hand. It was just this incredible workshop which really feels special and rare these days. There was simply no better group to trust in bringing the animatronics to life. So that was the backstory of the film. It was pretty long. I'm not sure how much of that's going to stay in the final video, but again, if you want to read the full thing, it'll be linked down below. But now we really move on to the heavy hitting stuff, the characters. Starting off with Mike. As an unemployed security guard with a checkered past who has stepped up to become the guardian to his younger sister, Mike has a lot on his plate, and that's before he accepts an overnight Watchmen gig at- The actor Josh Hutcherson apparently wasn't familiar with the game, but quickly immersed himself in the world of Five Nights at Freddy's, saying the game was very creepy, very intense. Because the world of Five Nights is larger than life, we wanted to find a way to ground these characters, and now we get into, again, that spoiler territory where we get to Mike's backstory. When Mike was 12, his younger brother Garrett, played by Lucas Grant, was taken by an unknown man from a park while Mike and his parents were only yards away. Mike has been haunted by that event and searching for his brother and his brother's kidnapper ever since, even in his dreams. Now he's become the de facto parent of his younger sister Abby, but is on the cusp of losing her because his demons are preventing him from being able to hold a steady job. They talk a bit about how Josh fit into the role of Mike, Emma Tammy saying he had this instinct for the character that was so authentic and so lived in. He had an incredible ability to keep Mike in a grounded place, even in the wildest of circumstances. Scott saying, when I watched him, I really believe that this guy is just doing his best to take care of his little sister. He is immediately likable and relatable, and you want him to be successful in what he is setting out to do. Josh talking about the animatronics saying, watching them come to life was incredible. They have this texture and quality that only Henson can do. As an actor, you get something physical and real to interact with. My character is supposed to be haunted by these things, and now I have a creature in front of me that, in the right light, is terrifying. And now I move on to Elizabeth Lale's character of Vanessa Shelley. Vanessa is a local police officer whose beat has long included the derelict family pizza restaurant Freddy Fazbear's. Initially, Vanessa is skeptical of new hire Mike, who has a penchant for falling asleep on the job, but as she learns more about him, she begins to sympathize with him, providing him some crucial history of Freddy's, as well as becoming an ally when Mike claims Rusty animatronics are acting in seemingly impossible ways. Elizabeth Lale leapt at the chance to play Vanessa, claiming my niece is a massive fan of the games. These characters are recognized around the world and I feel really grateful that I get to participate in a project with such a passionate fan base. And then we got a new quote from Emma Tammy about Vanessa, saying Vanessa in many ways was the most complicated character to inhabit. She's a cop, with a hidden agenda. Elizabeth did an incredible job finding the authenticity in Vanessa, not turning her into a caricature, but really giving her dimension and empathy. She had to be strong, but also exhibit softness and vulnerability, something also quoted by Scott. Strong on the outside, but had a lot of pain and confusion on the inside. As you can see next up, we have Piper Rubio's character of Abby. 10-year-old Abby is Mike's little sister, but his new role as her guardian has complicated their relationship. Because of this uneasy realignment, Abby has retreated inward, spending the bulk of her time churning out page after page of artwork depicting a seemingly mythical realm known only to her. But after Mike accepts his new job, he begins to notice a strange overlap between the unusual happenings at Freddy's and his sister's drawing. So that was something we absolutely speculated on, Abby's link to Freddy's, the haunted animatronics, you know, the spirits possessing the characters, especially Golden Freddy, and pretty simply, I mean, this document just confirmed that theory. Both saying, I can't 
kept going down the list trying to consider other auditions, but I kept going back to Piper's. I think what made her so great was just the fact that I believed her when she read her lines. She convinced me that she was Abby in her audition. Pretty heartwarming mention right here, Tammy remembers fondly the first time Rubio saw the animatronic characters. Her jaw just dropped. She turned to me and said, I thought they were just going to be men in green suits. She was over the moon that she was actually going to be meeting Freddy, Chica, Bonnie, and Foxy, and she would hug them first thing every time she came to set. Wow, that is really cute. And she would hug them every time she left. That is adorable, man. A quote from Piper herself saying, this movie has been the best experience, the most fun I've ever had. Tammy took special care of the young performer, especially during the film's more frightening moments. Emma would bring me this little rainbow owl plushie for me, his name was Owen. Later, I asked Emma if she could stop bringing Owen. I wanted to stay in character. Piper is the sweetest actor we could have ever had for this film. This whole, like, paragraphs about her character is just the cutest thing I've ever read. But now we move on to something a bit less cute, and that is Mary Stuart Masterson's Jane character and Kat Connor Sterling's Maxine character. Jane has become a fixture in the siblings' lives since the two began living on their own. Meddlesome and sharp-elbowed. Yikes. Jane disapproves of uh, Mike's attempts at raising Abby. So so much so that she's begun to register formal complaints with other caregivers in Abby's orbit. Though Jane insists she's agitating for no other reason than her loving concern for Abby, she may have ulterior motives. The lead up to this whole movie, the character of Jane, Mary Stuart Masterson's character, has been extremely fascinating. If you remember back in December, on Doggo's charity stream where we got some actors revealed for the film, this was when we first found out about Mary's involvement, the only role we knew of that she was playing was an unnamed female villain. So now that we have this description here, it gives us a bit more information about the character. She does, in fact, want custody of Abby. That's kind of the main reason why she's the villain. But I'm assuming towards the end of the movie, again, based on this description, it's going to be revealed why exactly she wants Abby so bad. She has some other big picture in mind, whether or not that means she is related to William in the form of being his wife or his sister or some other relationship, I don't know. I'm not entirely sure because it does say ooh, she has ulterior motives. You know, she's not just trying to get custody of Abby. It does kind of lend cadence to the theory that she is involved with William in some way. But your theories on Jane, I'd love to know. Let's move on to Max. Max is Abby's babysitter and caregiver while Mike is at work. Most likely when they say when Mike is at work, at his mall job. Because when he gets the job at Freddy's, you know, we see Abby very clearly go with him. And also in that one TV spot we looked at recently, Mike says, you know, I wasn't able to find a babysitter when Vanessa asks, why is she here? So whether, whether that means Max dies when her and all those people break into Freddy's, I'm not sure. That's my theory, at least. Max is attentive to Abby, but is quietly concerned that Mike may be unraveling and might not be capable of caring for his little sister. While her intentions are pure, she's easily manipulated by other people who may not have Mike and Abby's best interests at heart. Uh, that's my walking theory right now, is that she's being manipulated by Jane to perceive Mike as this like extremely bad guy who cannot cannot take care of Abby but I'd love to know your thoughts on Max as well and now let's move on to Matthew Lillard and Steve Raglan. A smug career counselor charged with helping Mike find a job. Steve Raglan has zero sympathy of the burdens of the unemployed. Wow, what a crazy line. Steve seems to take a perverse pleasure in forcing a desperate person like Mike into a situation that's less ideal. It's actually Steve who suggests the night guard job at Freddy's to Mike, who then bides his time like a spider until Mike reluctantly agrees to take it. So if you're still going into this film, and I don't know how you could be thinking that Steve Raglan is not William Afton, he's just this helpful career counselor who's trying to get Mike, you know, back up on his feet, you're dead wrong. I mean, this, <laughs> this paragraph spells it out pretty clearly, this guy's the bad guy. There was a long list of people we were looking at for this role, says Scott Cawthon. I was leaning towards Lillard early on because I had great memories of seeing Scream in theaters like 20 times with my roommates in college. But when a close friend of mine told me what a great guy he was in real life and how he took such good care of his fans at conventions, I knew Matthew was the right person for the job. I told him on the phone during our very first conversation that after the movie comes out, no one will even be able to imagine anyone else for the role, and I stand by that. Emma Tammy says Matthew brought so much zaniness and electricity into the mix, and he had such attention to what Five Nights fans would want to see. Matthew himself even saying, I've been eagerly waiting to get back into the horror genre. 
really coveting that opportunity. Scott saying this was a dream cast. And yes, I know this is the first cast I've ever worked with, but that doesn't change the fact that it was a dream cast. Now we move on to the final part of the document, details about the animatronic character designs, locations, etc. It's mostly about cast and crew, like right here, but there are some points I want to point out, like Scott Cawthon was on set regularly, acting as both an encyclopedia for the Five Nights universe's deep lore, and to ensure that the animatronic characters remain in line with his original vision. The most complex animatronic, Foxy, took six puppeteers to operate, with different human operators for Foxy's face, head, body, arms, and feet. During dress rehearsals, it took about an hour for performers Kevin Foster, playing Freddy, Jess Weiss, playing Chica, and Jade Kendall Martin, playing Bonnie, to don their animatronic suits. By the end of the shoot, the team was able to get all three performers dressed in less than five minutes. An hour to five minutes is crazy. Puppet Captain Artie Esposito asked his 10-year-old son, a fan of the Five Nights game series, for advice on how one of the animatronics, Golden Freddy, should move. The boy's suggestions were confirmed by game creator Scott Cawthon on set the following day. The movie was filmed in New Orleans, Louisiana. Principal photography lasted only 43 days. Set design details were taken directly from the games. Pretty self-explanatory. Director of photography Lynn Moncrief and director Emma Tammy designed a specific set of aesthetics to employ when inside of Freddy Fazbear's pizza, including different lenses and angles, point of view shots from the animatronics were often used as a way to increase tension. BFX supervisor Jonathan Deering worked with director Emma Tammy on ways to minimize the use of CGI, a goal from the film's outset. Costume designer Natalie O'Brien and her team worked to include a multitude of Easter eggs in the film's on-screen wardrobe, something we've seen pretty clearly with Joseph Poliquin's character of Carl. He has an Easter egg of FNAF 6's Midnight Motorist minigame on his t-shirt, and that is going to do it for this info document. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. I've been recording for about an hour. Hopefully, if this is still a pretty long video, you still enjoyed it. I always love stuff like this, getting a peek behind the curtain on film, seeing, uh, you know, quotes from not only Scott and the director and Jason Blum, but also the actors and actresses involved. Like, that was an amazing thing to see. Well, that's going to do it for this video. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all on the flip side. Goodbye.